uh, Senator Grassley. Um, Ms. Gross, you and uh, Dr. Jenkins both talked about how EVs can contribute to our electric grid security um, through peak shaving or even putting power back into the grid when it's needed. Um, in terms of peak shaving, you'd need the capacity to tell charging EVs to stop charging through the peak period and then automatically resume charging. Uh, so you'd need a signal to the automobile from the utility and willingness of the consumer to accept that. To do that peak shaving function, what does Congress need to do to help? Are there standards that need to be built in? Is the industry doing it on its own? And let me ask you to go first, and, and Dr. Jenkins, if you had uh, added thoughts, you can follow up. But Ms. Gross, you first, please. Sure, happy, uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Happy to, uh, to talk through this one. Uh, yeah, the electric vehicles, is it's unlike a, a load we've ever seen before um, on the grid. It's the smartest, biggest, and most flexible load. So there's this huge opportunity to charge the vehicles at night. Many, not all, not all, not if you're taking a long distance trip or you're trucking and you have to uh, travel during the day. But that opportunity to charge when the grid has um, spare capacity is a huge opportunity. It's going to keep our costs low on the grid too, that, that capital investment in ever increasing the peak that has to be served on the, load, on the grid. So these, this idea that V to G and V1 G, um, either single direction, which is basically smart charging. Charge when I want you to. V to G, meaning vehicle to grid. Beg your pardon? V to G, meaning vehicle to grid. Vehicle to grid, yeah. perfect. Uh, vehicle to grid is, um, and also vehicle to grid, meaning bi, and also bi-directional. So that not only can I take power from the grid when there's plenty of surplus capacity at night or maybe when a lot of sun is shining in, in uh, some of the states, um, but I can also give back to the grid when there are times when the grid is struggling to keep up with maybe load on the grid. And so V to G is certainly a promise that's out there. There's a lot of work getting uh, done in that area, but smart charging ask, is here um, today. you and uh, Dr. Jenkins both to provide a written recommendation to Senator Graham and to myself about what we might do working together to make sure that as EVs come online, they have the necessary capability so that the consumer can take advantage of that capability. And also, if you're gonna offer a utility that capability, that adds value to the utility. What benefit should the consumer get from the utility for uh, offering up their vehicle as a resource, either by taking it willingly offline during peak periods or by limiting charging to the night or however that works. It's a, Bit of a complicated question, but I think there's room for real bipartisan activity here, and I'd love to have a recommendation from uh, both of you. Um, in my remaining two minutes, uh, Ms. Henman, first of all, thank you for all your uh, terrific work. You've described the economic and national security risks of Chinese, which you called weaponized supply chains. Is there also a climate risk associated with uh, China's supply chains? Um, yes, uh, thank you so much, Senator. Absolutely. So. Um, China's and is there a policy that would help fix that? I, 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 think, I, I think I know of at least one. Um, there, China's rent seeking also arrives in this form of sort of what we call environmental arbitrage or um, creating a pollution subsidy. So essentially how it works, even though China has the technical capacity to enforce its own environmental rules um, because it produces many of those in technologies and in fact in air pollution control in particular is the world's leading exporter of, of, of air pollution control technology. Um, there's widespread evidence that China, uh, particularly among their state-owned enterprises, intentionally reduces its inspection rates and then refuses to operate its air pollution control um, machinery. Now, <clears throat> if you look at like a, a coal fire power plant scrubber, if you leave that scrubber off, that reduces your energy costs of operation of air pollution control um, uh, materials by about 15 to 20% total. So you're, you're getting a 15 to 20% pollution subsidy on your total energy production for every thing that you produce that comes off that coal fire power plant. Um, 
I, I don't know a single manufacturing firm in the United States that wouldn't love a 20% a subsidy on their energy costs. Um, this is deeply unfair. It's, an, it's unfair in terms of competitive sense, but also in a climate and environmental sense, because that is uh, SOx, NOx, and of course carbon and other, and other um, um, climate pollutants being pumped up into the air um, at, a, at a deeply unfair rate that it advances our um, um, sort of uh, decline in, in terms of, of climate stability. Um, one important way that we could counter this is that both the United States and, and friends could actually levy a border fee that corrects for, for this market imbalance and levels the playing field in terms of both climate and other uh, pollution values. Um, the figures behind this are known, and I know there's uh, several very good bills floating around the Hill right now, both on the quantification side, but also on the particulars on those measures and how we might work with partners. And that makes a perfect segue to Senator Graham, who, along with Senator Cassidy, has a bill to that effect. And I would note that uh, Ambassador Lighthizer, who is President Trump's trade representative, is also a fan of that policy. So with, uh, with that, let me turn it over to uh, Senator Graham and thank him again for uh, put, helping put this hearing together.